Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Manish Parashar. I'm the director of the uh, Ski Institute. Uh, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today uh, for the first uh, distinguished lecture for this academic year. Uh, Dr. Susan Gregorick uh, is a director for the Office of uh, Data Science Strategy at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, she, she was uh, appointed Associate Director for Data Science and, and the Director of the Office in September 2019. Under her leadership, uh, the Office leads the implementation of the NIH Strategic Plan for Data Science through scientific, technical, and operational collaboration with the institutes, centers, and offices that comprise the NIH. Dr. Gregorick was also instrumental in the creation of this office in 2018 and served as a senior advisor to the office until uh, being named in a current position as director. Dr. Gregorick was previously the division director for biophysics, biomedical technology, and computational biosciences at the National Institute of General Medicine Sciences, Medical Sciences. Prior to joining NIH, Dr. Gregorick was a program director in the Office of Biological and Environmental Research at the Department of Energy. Uh, before beginning her career in government service, Dr. Gregorick was a professor of computational chemistry at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Her research interests include dynamics of large biological macromolecules, and an area of expertise are computational biology, high-performance computing, neutron scattering, and bioinformatics. Dr. Gregorick received an undergraduate degree in chemistry and mathematics from the University of Michigan and a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Maryland. I've had the pleasure of working with Susan wearing my other hat at uh, OSTP and at uh, the National Science Foundation. And it's just a great pleasure to have her here uh, at, uh, well, virtually at Utah. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Over to you, Susan. Thank you so much, Manish. Boy, it's so nice to, um, well, virtually be here. I, I kind of wish that I was not virtual, but actually in person, because then I would have much more opportunities to talk with everybody and learn a little bit more about the science that you're interested in and the challenges that you face. Manish filled me in a little bit and I'm gonna carry on those conversations with Manish and hopefully with others um, from the Ski Institute. What a great acronym, acronym. So as Manish said, I am the Associate Director for Data Science and my role and the role of my office is catalytic. Our job is to see where the data science and artificial intelligence fields of science are moving and help NIH um, position itself to take full advantage of those scientific and technical capabilities. Um, so what you're gonna see here today is uh, a little bit of what we've done, but this is meant to be a conversation. And so what I hope is that we can carry on these conversations, not just today, but in the future as well as, um, you know, as a federal agent, my role is to be a partner with researchers um, to really help enable greater science. And I think that we all agree that we do need greater science to connect data, enhance software, and potentially create a, a data ecosystem. All right, let's see if the slides transition okay. Sometimes it doesn't work like you think it's gonna. Um, so if it doesn't transition, you gotta just let me know, otherwise I'll carry on. Um, there are things that keep me up at night. These may or may not be the same things that keep you up at night, but I talk to a lot of researchers and this is generally a worry for many people, which is in two years, in 2023, you're gonna submit a grant to NIH, I hope. It might be an R01, it might be a center grant, might be a multi-PI uh, grant. You're gonna need to submit a data management and sharing plan. And I'll talk about that just FYI, in case you don't know that. You're, you're gonna ask me and you're gonna ask your program directors, so how am I gonna put those FAIR principles into practice? Where do you start? What do you do? We have to have answers um, before 2023, which is gonna require a lot of work on NIH's part and the community's part to, to really get to that data management and sharing plan. 
This is another use case that I work on a lot. This is just an example, but it comes in many different flavors and it looks like this. I'm studying a particularly challenging problem. There is no one single data source or repository or platform that has enough data that allows me to um, work on my hypothesis. Here's a hypothesis in rare pediatric cancer that we're looking for identifying causal variants in the genome. There's no one source that has all the participants. Children you know, are not a large part of our population. Um, so I need to aggregate data across different systems. Moreover, oftentimes, if you're uh, in a study, clinical study, you're often in many different types of clinical studies. My own family participates in clinical studies, and so we populate many different databases. You want to dis uh, disambiguate those participants across uh, data systems. So I'll tell you a little bit of what we're working on to basically look at data across systems. And then I hope that we'll have time to have a conversation about the intersection between data scientists computer scientists, information science, and in my domain, um, biomedical research. Let me tell you about our data management and sharing policy, just in case you don't know. I'll go pretty quick because I'm, I'm hoping that you do know. But by January 25 of 2023, NIH will require all researchers to prospectively plan for how their scientific data will be preserved and shared by your submission of a data management and sharing plan which will be submitted with your grant application as part of your ju budget justification section. You're gonna to have to tell us how you plan to manage your scientific data, how you plan to manage your metadata, where it will be shared. And of course, we understand that there are uh, special uh, populations. And so you'll need to tell us any type of potential restrictions or limitations to data sharing. Although the plan is put in at the time uh, that you submit your proposal, it's not um, peer reviewed in the sense that it's scored. Your reviewers on your study section will look at your data management and sharing plan and they may comment on it, but it's not scored. However, your NIH program directors will look at it. They will take it into consideration. It may become part of the funding discussion. Even if you're submitting a, a contract, you still need to submit a budget uh, data management and sharing plan as part of your technical evaluation. And by the way, this isn't just for the extramural community, our intramural researchers, which is about 10% of our population of NIH staff, also need to submit a data management and sharing plan with their, um, the way that they're funded through their work. There are just a few limitations to this. Generally, this will apply to, apply to all research um, conducted by extramural grads, contracts, and intramural researchers, as I've said, but it does not apply to uh, those who are submitting training grants, infrastructure development grants, or non-research activities. So the vast majority of our community will be uh, submitting these plans. And so, you know, what can we expect? And more importantly, how can my office and how can NIH really uh, help the community with data sharing? I know that you know what FAIR is. This is sort of a nice graphic from my friend Ingrid Dillo that really puts into perspective visuals that go along with the findability of data, accessibility, interoperability, reusability. All of these things we, we at NIH are thinking about, you, the community, are thinking about as well. So let me tell you what we're doing besides thinking, because um, if we have a plan and a policy and we don't have any action behind it, it's, it's not really an effective plan. So one of the things that we've started to do is to really think about how can we utilize artificial intelligence machine learning to uh, basically make data more fair ready. So we know that making data more AI or fair ready is not simply form formulaic. It's sort of a feedback loop. It requires engagement from the researchers, potentially from uh, computer scientists, information scientists uh, in use case driven uh, research. There are aspects of data such as the representation of information, or the presence of noise or uncertainty in the metadata labelings, or even in the amount of data, you know, the fact that data is very often in the work that we're doing, not a complete set. <laughs> and so how can we utilize AI to make data more fair? There's other considerations that we want to think about as well, data documentation and provenance, and particularly for health-related research, attention to biases in data, implicit or, or even explicit, um, that could be um, ready components that help researchers um, make data more 
more informed and utilize ethical decisions from the data. So these are things that we aren't just thinking about, we're putting into practice and here's how we're doing it. Um, this past year, we, su we uh, supported a number of collaborations to improve the AI readiness of existing NIH data. So this does go against the ACD AI recommendations to NIH and artificial intelligence, which basically told us start from scratch and generate new data and make it AI ready. And, and that's a good and laudable goal, but uh, we've invested a lot of money in data and there's a great amount of computer science work in data imputation that we can leverage. And so we've done that. We uh, support collaborations that bring together biomedicine, biomedical researchers, researchers who are familiar with data management and artificial intelligence um, to basically support these, these goals. And here you see the institutes and centers that are partnering with my office in this work. And, and all I think all of our institutes signed on, but um, not all of them had funded awards. We made 36 awards, the statistics are here. Interestingly, the most common biomedical focus area was Alzheimer's disease, um, which has a vast amount of uh, data through the um, Alzheimer's initiative, cardiovascular disease and aging. Most common data types will not surprise you, imaging, uh, omics, electronic healthcare records. And what surprised me was the amount of researchers who wanted to impugn uh, better uh, AI ready data in speech. That, that was a surprise. I want to just illustrate um, of the nine awards we made in imaging, uh, three of them that, that illustrate different ways in which researchers are making data AI ready uh, in the imaging domain. I selected them because I, I, I sort of inferred that this would be the most interest to, to the community here today. So Rick Beck, um, uh, Desai, Desai is looking at how researchers study concepts um, that are represented in the brain. And so what he's basically doing is he has um, MFRI images, neuroimaging data sets, and he's using semantic langu language techniques to create a much more machine ready uh, metadata format. John Gilman is studying imaging and image analysis uh, methodologies to help identify young, really young children who might be at risk for schizophrenia. And so um, this is actually a pretty cool project. He's uh, He's bridging the missing time point data in his imaging data sets um, by extrapolating from existing uh, imaging time points using an out of distribution detection um, uh, algorithm. And finally, um, probably everybody knows Carl Kesselman. He's the face of FaceSpace. He's the infrastructure um, uh, guru of FaceSpace. FaceSpace is a consortium of distributed network of researchers investigating craniofacial development dysmorphia. And uh, what he's doing is he's um, streamlining the curation of the, of the craniofacial images that are coming into the FaceSpace using uh, machine learning approaches to improve the metadata description elements um, while also uh, paying attention to the fact that these are identifiable data. And so he's, he's uh, taking into account the restrictions on the data handling from this data set. So this just gives you a snapshot uh, of some of the types of things that we are supporting in this program. I, I fully believe that this program uh, is of value to the community. We'd like to see additional work in this area so you can anticipate more funding opportunities. In, basically um, making data more fair and more AI ready. There are other work that we're doing um, to support fair data sharing. I'm gonna talk about how we're supporting data repositories. I might go quickly um, in case this is just not completely of interest to everybody, but I just wanna give you a sense that it's part of the conversation is to support the creation and enabling of fair data. But the other part of the conversation is making the data go somewhere that researchers can find it and access and use it in a very facile way. So there are many options, but the first option that NIH strongly encourages is to utilize the community-driven open access data sharing repositories um, that support the community of your work. So FaceSpace, if you're interested in craniofacial uh, research, FaceSpace would be your first choice of, of where you should support your data. I came from the structural biology community, Protein Data Bank, GEO, for example, genomics, uh, SRA, if you're looking at um, raw sequences. So there are community-driven repositories. Lacking that, there are other options. For example, um, with a partnership with AWS's open data platform, researchers can now submit their data as part of their supplemental materials 
um, and as data sets with their publications, uh, they do go into the AWS Open Data Platform. Um, they are not given, I do not believe they are given unique identifiers for the data. They may be, but I, I, I think that might be a, a sort of a child of the parent DOI. Certainly would um, only be able to find and search those data based on um, the publication. There are other opportunities um, with commercial nonprofit repositories that are more generalist. For example, Zenodo, uh, Dryad, Fixshare, um, Dataverse. We are working with all of these partners. I'll talk just a little bit about that. And then lacking that, I'll tell you about our partnerships with the cloud service providers in our program stride. So there are options. But again, as a first choice, we strongly support our communities, data sharing repositories and in different ways. We support uh, repositories to align to the trust principles here um, shown really quickly. And thanks to my colleague, Dalai Nguyen, um, with RDA and the core trust seal who developed these principles for transparency, for responsibility, user focus, sustainability, and technology. I just want to give a shout out to OSDP at, um, and the great work that they've done with us in collaboration, um, NLM and NIH to align the FAIR principles with the desired characteristics for all data repositories. These should all be very familiar, hopefully, um, unique identif persistent identifiers for data and hopefully as well as a repository, data that has accompanying metadata, for example, um, provenance tracking, uh, you know, documentation and security protocols. So these are all great principles and practices, but in reality, um, we know that repositories and knowledge bases come in very different sizes and complexities and at different levels of maturity. They're all valuable to research, um, but uh, their spectrum and ability to adhere to these characteristics, whether they be fair or trust or the OST characteristics varies, and so does their readiness. Moreover, developing metrics for evaluating the use and utility and impact of any given repository um, is, has a wide spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of capabilities in the community. And so getting some alignment and supporting that um, with our repositories is a goal for NIH. So again, putting words into practice, one of the things that we did this year is to support the existing NIH data repositories to align with the fair and trust principles and to help them and their communities develop uh, user uh, statistics, utility and impact um, capabilities. So this is just saying what I just said, align to fair, um, develop uh, characteristics. We have funded 14 awards um, and we have a number of institutes and centers participating. All the institutes and centers sign on to the NOSI. All of this is supported by my office. Oh, I didn't list any of them. Um, uh, I can get that for you. I'm sorry that I don't have the list of what we supported. There's another path that we're supporting uh, NIH uh, data repositories and knowledge bases. We released two funding opportunities uh, in 2020 for the support of biomedical data repositories and knowledge bases. And if you're familiar with the Elixir program, this is the most closely aligned program to their core uh, resource repository program. We, we took all of the work that they were doing and we mapped it to what NIH could support. We're supporting these resources to have scientific impact, not just in the communities for which they're driven, but uh, for broader scientific impact. We require community engagement um, with their researchers, but also with the journals. We uh, ask resources to not think about innovation but really think about the quality of service and data, the efficiency of operations. And finally, there's a section in the request for funding um, about how these resources will be governed in their external advisory committees. So this again is to support data repositories and knowledge bases, not as R01 type of grants, but as true resources. They're evaluating a SEP um, chaired by CSR um, and that SEP is uh, composed of research, uh, research uh, investigators who are either themselves PIs of repositories or knowledge bases or community uh, members who are active users. We uh, have supported so far six applications and here's just two of the ones that I suspect most people know about, Uniprot and Bioportal. Uniprot is the protein sequence and function resource. 
and bioportals and extensive um, knowledge base for biomedical entities and relationships. We uh, will continue this funding announcement. Um, it does come up for renewal in 2023. We're also working with the generalist repositories and hopefully with many repositories to create an ecosystem of, of data repositories where we can cooperate on shared goals like shareable metadata, uh, identifiers, authentication, and other activity standard metrics. Um, and uh, support what's unique about each of these repositories, their dashboards, visualizations, analytics, or linking to data or other sources. So from this, um, you'll see launched uh, probably in November or December, an initiative um, that does create an ecosystem of repositories. And this is really built on the foundational uh, workshop that was chaired by Marianne Matone and Shelley Stahl, both leaders in data science, uh, to help us flesh out how do you actually create an ecosystem of data repositories that uh, really make it easier for researchers to find and access data across many different repositories. So now that I've talked about creating more fair data and enhancing and supporting data repositories, uh, let me talk a little bit about um, doing a lift and shift to the cloud and then creating a platform interoperability in the cloud. So to do that, I have to tell you about our partnership with AWS, Google, and just as of July, Microsoft Azure. So STRIDES is short for Science and Technology Research Infrastructure for Discovery, Experimentation, and Sustainability. And what it is, um, it is pretty, pretty basic. Um, it's basically the discounts for storing data in any of these three cloud service providers and discounts on computational capabilities or computes. In addition, we do provide a certain amount of training for educators and researchers in basic cloud computing. We also um, do partner uh, with our cloud service providers on some of the innovative technologies that they offer in particular in um, enhancement of algorithms to run very efficiently in the cloud, I'll show that, as well as in the artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's, that partnership has uh, started in 2018 and it continues today. And what you'll see is that, um, you know, we've enrolled over uh, 550 programs, projects, and, and research in STRIDES. We are storing now 115 petabytes of data shared between AWS, Google, and soon Microsoft Azure. We've trained a number of people, that's everybody from undergraduates to senior investigators and offered um, 100 million uh, compute hours. So it's it's been a, a good learning experience and I'm going to show you what we've done and where we're where our struggles are because I think that's where the conversations are the most interesting. So part a good part of that 115 petabytes of data is actually sequence data. The sequence read archive is uh, raw sequences of everything from you know um, microbes to plants to chickens to rats to people. More than 48 petabytes of that is, share, is shared between Google and AWS. Um, it's probably the largest biomedical data set that we have. Um, managing 48 petabytes across two clouds is an interesting challenge in provenance. And also an interesting challenge in how you optimize the storage and compute of that much data in a cost-effective manner. We've really gotten to know the different levels of uh, glacier storage and how you rapidly move data in and out to freeze and thaw on demand for our research community. Um, there's been some other challenges, but first the good news. So, you know, one of the things that we were able to do because, you know, we have petabyte scale data, but it's only effective if you can actually uh, search and align those sequences together to give you some answers to your hypothesis. So there was some work done early on in the, uh, the um, evolution of SARS-CoV-2 uh, over the last, um, I think, 20 years, um, looking at how it's, how it's changed and how it's rapidly changing now um, as it moves across the world. And so in this work, um, researchers were able to basically uh, efficiently use bow ties 
um, and this is with partnership with AWS to do a very large sequence ana analysis for viral discovery. But um, what they were also able to do <laughs> was to efficiently um, do the analysis in just a couple of days. If they had just basically downloaded all the data that takes a lot of time, there's egress fees, um, it would have taken them at least a year to do this, this work. So um, moving it to the cloud has created greater scientific capabilities. It's somewhat cost savings for the research community, but there's pluses and minuses to that. Um, but we are able to, to really look at some interesting scientific hypothesis. But there's some challenges, and these are challenges that aren't just shared by NIH, they're shared by all federal agents, agencies, which is how do you effectively search sequences, for example, on petabytes of very large uh, data. So we're focusing uh, an interactive effort with DOE. This is actually um, developing real tools um, that has a focus on metagenomics. And we're developing tools to query raw SRA data across the cl two clouds um, on the one to two petabyte scale as a trial basis. And we're benchmarking these tools um, with the National Microbiome Data Collaborative. This is a DOE funded initiative, again, focusing solely on metagenomics. The hope is that we will have a first uh, run prototype of these tools out in, in the summer of 22 for the research community to start to use and we'll keep iterating and refining. But um, this is sort of a, a, a holy grail for I think both agencies is great. Now that we've put all this data in the cloud, how can we effectively search on it? And search is a common theme that we're finding in many of our large scale data platforms. So we have you know, 115 petabytes of data on the cloud, but how are we gonna actually make any sense of it and find effective um, uh, data, cohorts and information? Some of the things that we're doing to democratize the cloud a little bit <laughs> to our research community is a pilot cloud cloud lab. We have a number of institutes that we support in idea states or under resource institutes or HBCU or minority serving institutes where the barrier to accessing the cloud is, is much greater maybe than we had anticipated. I often hear, and maybe you do too, why should I move all of my compute and analytics to the cloud when I have my on-prem server and my on-prem work and I, I, I know exactly what to do. This is a, this is a heavy lift. So we're just um, piloting this experience that will provide NIH uh, funded groups easy access to the cloud in a sandbox environment where they have $500 of uh, compute for free as well as uh, some gold standard data sets and uh, some common workflows. And we're pilot, uh, partnering with different universities to develop those workflows and those gold standard data sets. And it's just meant to help our community have more experience um, with the cloud before they make any financial commitments. If they choose not to, I'd love to talk more about how we can think about hybrid compute environments. We are um, developing the same type of uh, for our high throughput uh, workflow pipelines. There's a lot of folks who, who say, you know, the architecture of the chips is evolving. It's very rapid. I need to optimize my software and my hardware for those cloud environments. And I really, um, I need to benchmark things first before I make a wholesale investment. And so the technical cloud lab will allow prototyping of new architects and environments, um, again, um, in an NIH sandbox. And then finally, we, we provide a lot of training, a lot of codathons, and so this is also meant to be a sandbox for our training purposes. So this is something that we'll be launching um, probably in the next few months. We're building it now. So, you know, it's great that we've moved all this data <laughs> um, and did a pretty heavy lift and shift of many activities to the cloud. But really where science benefits is when we can think across all of our siloed institutes. We have a genomics institute, we have a heart, lung and blood institute, we have a cancer institute, we have common fund, we have a library, and each of them are developing platforms and they are truly silos of excellence. So creating something that's a little bit more interoperable and aggregatable is the goal of the cloud platform interoperability effort which just aims to establish and implement guidelines and technical capabilities for end users. And this is done in a sort of an agile process and it's all done based on use cases. So I'm gonna show you at least one of these use cases. This is one. Um, 
investigators are interested in understanding genetic factors that relate to congenital heart defect in children. So what they want to do in this use case is they have a healthy cohort um, from two studies from NHLBI that's housed in Biodata Catalyst. But then they, they know that they found data in the genome taught in uh, GTEx that's housed in Anvil, as well as in the kids' first um, effort. And they want to pool all these data together and do an analysis on Terra. That's, that's their use case. So how can we make that happen? Well, interoperability, um, and thanks to my colleague, Melissa Handel, is really in the eye of the beholder. And there's so many challenges. There's just the legal challenge of restriction of data that can only be combined um, in certain ways because it's all consented differently. And then there's the access challenge of just making sure that we have the right uh, access controls. Um, it won't surprise you to learn that each and every one of these platforms have their own identity and access management system. Um, and then there's just getting platforms to crosswalk and talk to each other. You know, moving data and analysis sounds like it's easy, but nope, it's not. And finally, data is often uh, has different ontologies and different standards and different data models. And how can we actually, um, you know, think about integrated analytics, and integrated data? So we have we are working on these problems. I'm going to show you some early uh, examples of where we are, but you can trust me, we're not done. <laughs> So the first thing that we've done is the very first step, which is just improving the fact that researchers need access to data in a very seamless, streamlined and seamless manner um, that for them is, is one stop shop. Um, so I'm gonna show you the work that we've done in a program called Researcher Auth Services. Uh, it's leveraging a lot of work in community standards Okay, so mostly of this is coming from the genomics community and from GA4GH, but it's extending now to in commons um, and as well as some of the efforts at NSF actually. Um, and most importantly for us and maybe for you, uh, we have to align with the administrative cybersecurity goals. The administration is going to a zero trust, uh, um, you know, cyber uh, platform. And so we have to align to some of these security goals and multi-factor authentication is gonna come to a platform near, near you very soon. So here's what it looked like um, three years ago. You wanted to get data from any of our systems. If they all had their own identity access management processes, none of them talked to each other. You would essentially have to go to every single platform, get the data you want and download it into your system. Now, for some people, this can take a couple years because you have to go through the data access committee. Um, uh, and so there's no way that it was streamlined. Uh, it was kind of a pain in the butt. So what we have done is we've created uh, our research auth services. It's one stop shop. Um, it's a partnership across the NIH and with our Center for uh, Information Technology, uh, utilizes uh, you know, sort of standard passporting and, and uh, mm. sign protocols so that you can log in with your NIH ER <coughs> comments um, identity. And uh, actually, I think it's now possible to also log in with your university credentials. Um, and we're moving to ORCID, we're moving to EduGain, and, and I don't know if we'll ever get to Google, there's some, some multi-factor authentication that is going to be required um, for, for data access. But we've made a lot of progress. So you know now you don't have to go through four or five different um, identity access management uh, systems, you can just log in once and see the data that you have access to. So that's making life a little easier for people. <clears throat> and um, where we're going now is we're working with In Commons, the In Commons Federation, and researchers from organizations to support um, your university credentialing systems. As long as your university supports multi factor authentication that you're using to read your email, for example, you'll be able to log into our systems. And here are all the repositories at NIH that are currently connecting to our research or auth services, all the big ones that we started working with early on, um, Common Fund Kids First, Biodata Catalyst, Cancer Research, uh, Data Commons, Anvil. <clears throat> uh, now NCBI <clears throat> has connected, all of us has connected, and we're connecting um, the larger Common Fund Data Ecosystem that I'll talk about, as well as the Mental Health Data Archive. We're working with MIDRIC, I'll talk about MIDRIC. Um, we're working with NCATS and the N3C. Um, we're working with NIAID, which I think is actually logged in, logging on now with RAS. So <clears throat> most of our platforms are moving to shared identity access management, um, which I think will provide 
uh, a level of uh, easily transparency login for researchers and hopefully for NIH also ways to manage it, um, uh, incidents in a much more facile way. Okay, so our vision for interoperability, now that we can log in, we have one unified uh, authen -Auth c through our, our RAS system. Uh, we're working on <laughs> a facile search. We have a number of different options. Um, one of the ones we use is PFB, search across all of our systems. Fire, by the way, Fast Healthcare Interoperable Resources is proving to be another really interesting way to search for data because you're structured into a resource um, that has a, an ontology that you can search across. And of course, pulling the data into different um, platforms um, through the DIRS system developed by GA4GH and then allowing researchers to compute across all of these systems. So this is the vision and here's where we are. We're able to search using um, PFB um, developed by University of Chicago. We're starting to implement fast healthcare interoper interoperable resources. We're developing manifests. So we have a number of different ways to search across our our platforms that are in our NCPI system. We are implementing DIRS as a way to sort of have pointers to those data in your cloud buckets. And then of course, um, all of your uh, auth and auth is handled by RAS through the passporting system of your data. So your data, you have a passport that has all the data and all the systems that you have access to. And here's where we are. Here's what we've been able to accomplish. So Dr. Melissa Wilson, who is at the University of Arizona, is studying um, sex as a biological variable. She really wants to look at the state of X and Y chromosome calling. She's able to uh, find all of those data through Anvil, Biodata Catalyst, Kids First, and Cats or Commons Research Framework, all four of our platforms. Um, she pulls all that data into her Terra system on demand. She doesn't have to copy. She doesn't have to download. She can access uh, 11, about 11 petabytes, it's a small scale study of data um, in Terra and compute on Terra for the first time. And so this is our first real win that we're able to log in easily to all four systems, find the data of interest in all four systems, pu pull that data into uh, Terra through the DIRS pointers and then compute and get the results. So yay, that's, you know, and this has been about 18 months of work and it's just one use case. We have a number of others that we are working on. It's all done in an agile system. Um, so I, I hope that the community will come with us as we start to build out more. This was a pilot that we hope to instantiate into a real program in 2022. But there are other systems that are also developing data ecosystems. In case you're familiar with the Common Fund, there are a number of Common Fund programs. We're working with the Common Fund to enable researchers to um, easily query across the common fund data sets. They're developing um, basically a metadata catalog um, with some hardcore um, ontologies. They're now gonna implement DIRS to find their data. They're training users in common fund. These are all the common fund data systems. We are working with um, 10 of their DCCs uh, that are circled here, HubMap, Kids First, GTEx, Lynx, and um, HMP. And, we're also working with MIDRIC. MIDRIC is relatively new, funded by NIBIB. It is the medical imaging and data resource. We're trying to create interoperability across MIDRIC, the um, N3C National COVID Cancer uh, COVID Collaborative, the Biodata Catalyst, the All of Us, and then um, the Idea State CTRs. So what we want to do is we want to um, create. So I'm going to show it to you a system that will easily allow researchers to um, find data, again, using a lot of the work that we've already developed um, across uh, all of our systems and compute on it um, by creating and redefining the security boundaries um, for the system. So some of the problems we face is really in, in the cybersecurity uh, world. And so we're, we're redefining how we create our security boundaries on our systems. Um, because the example that I showed you earlier was really hard due to all the uh, ways we had to reconfigure security. So we want to actually create a much more um, facile security boundary uh, system uh, with interconnect uh, agreements and also some security protocols that will enable us to integrate um, platforms uh, such as Medric into our system. 
Okay, so I talked about software. I talked about fair data, repositories, and interoperability. Let me tell you what we're doing in software. I'm really happy to say that we have a partnership with Manish um, and um, NSF in the smart and connected health field to create new innovations in computer and information science to support health and medicine. And um, the work that we're doing here uh, supports a number of activities uh, that, is part, that is a partnership between NSF and NIH. NSF is the holder of the applications and the manager of the review. After NSF has done the review, we partner with them to help select those applications that NIH would like to fund, and then those are taken back to NIH. Um, but it's a collaborative partnership. And so if you're interested in information infrastructure, knowledge graphs, or transformative data science could be um, uh, new ways to impugn uh, FAIR data, or could be new visualizations for data, or you're interested in multimodal sensors and hardware systems, or even effective reusability of data, um, or automating um, health data decisions, um, if you're interested in imaging, the one I see that has signed on for imaging is cancer. They're very interested in cancer-related imaging projects. All of our ICs have signed on to that, um, that initiative. We also have other initiatives. Um, Dan Katz talks about the great uh, golf or desert of software. So there's the academic software we're all very familiar with, and then there's industry-scale software. And in between, there's not a lot of funding for software hardening. And this is particularly problematic at NIH because our study sections are not necessarily attuned to software development. They always have to see this as part of a biological hypothesis. And so what we want to do in our office is to enhance software engineering, which provides a valuable resource for scientific development of software to enable new collaborations between biomedical researchers and software engineers and to um, encourage the adoption of cloud computing in strides. It's encouraged again, but not required. This is another initiative that all of our institutes have signed on to, and it's been wildly successful. The institute directors are super happy with this. Um, in 2020, we funded 28 awards. We have now seen about 120 scientific publications. Uh, the University of Texas, um, North Texas group uh, has been doing some really nice density functional theory um, software development development. They're now working with Azure, and they've developed this really cool graphic novel um, for the Latinx community. There's some really nice work that's been done um, here at the University of Utah. So I did pull these up, and I apologize if I don't get the science completely right. Some of this is really not in my field at all. But um, Rob McLeod is, um, and this is exactly what these programs are designed for. Um, he's providing the Center for Integrative Biomedical Computing and robust software hardening with a partnership with Kitware. And why is he doing this? Is to increase the usability and sustainability of all the tools that were developed from this BTRR. This is exactly what this program is designed for. Jeff Weiss is um, providing the biomedical and biophysics community with enhanced uh, finite element biophysics software through uh, some really nice APIs and also some really good work here with Kubernetes to have portability in hybrid cloud environments. And so this is to improve the sustainability and the reusability both of FE Bio and FE Bio Studio. And then Ingo Titsa, I'm sorry if I got the name wrong, um, is doing something that sounds pretty cool. It's really providing the voice and speech researchers who are utilizing Vox and Silico software, um, a whole refresh and cold modernization, including um, nice work in TensorFlow. Again, to, to think about um, cross-platform computability. And so this will just help our researchers uh, who are interested in exploring um, vocal ligament, uh, vocal cord um, pitch range and stabilization uh, of vocalization. So some really nice work that's supplemented through the, these awards to basically harden and improve or sustain software in new ways. I am sure that this program will continue in 2022 and beyond. So if you're interested, please look for those software supplements. We also um, have done a lot of work with our software communities and GitHub and the journals to think about best practices for software sharing because we want to provide transparency um, and rigor and reproducibility, of course, for conducting research. We also want to foster reuse and collaboration in our software communities. NIH wants to track our investments in software. Trust me, if you try to find any software grant that's funded in NIH, it's going to take quite an interesting search. And finally, we wanna create software and code um, that can share best practices. 
including um, metadata and citations. And for me also, alignment of our strategic plan. So we have uh, generated an FAQ for your consideration to provide information on how you make software more open and citable. If you're developing research software, but you really want to use that in real medical practices and real clinical settings, what are some of the things that you need to think about? And this is in collaboration with FDA and the Office of General Counsel. What are some software vulnerabilities and cybersecurity vulnerabilities? Um, interesting for us, and we'll be asking for uh, a request for information on what are some of the key metadata that we all need um, to make data more software, sorry, to make software more findable. We, we did this based on lessons learned by trying to find all your software. And then what are some benchmarking and provenance that you might wanna consider for software? And again, these aren't policies, these are just best practices. And we're gonna ask the community for your input on these so that we can, with your help, um, improve our best practices. Finally, actioning um, biomed um, AI. So there's a lot of really great opportunities for AI. It has the promise for reanalysis um, of data. So data by itself is not as valuable or as interesting as looking at comparative and cor correlative relationships among large numbers of data sets. That also has a lot of interesting problems in there. Um, and inferring model relationships on aggregated data sets. Um, it's, it's not just semantics or, or um, symbolic. There's just a lot of really interesting and tropical uh, work that could happen. The thought of um, how we can advance semantic and um, artificial intelligence and harmonize data, as well as how we can um, make uh, AI more explainable and with ethical considerations. And finally, um, and this is really important for NIH, uh, how we can utilize uh, AI to help some of our most vulnerable populations. It, you know, if you look at the training sets of AI, they tend to be in mostly of people who might look more or less like me, but our population doesn't look like me. It's, it's very diverse. And so improving AI for addressing um, health disparities is, is a goal of NIH. So I'm gonna tell you about that goal and what we're doing. Uh, we've recently launched our Consortium um, to Advance Health Equality and Research Diversity, our aim ahead, to establish mutually beneficial and coordinated partnerships with a very large community of people um, to uh, bring underserved communities in the development of AI models, algorithms, and data, um, beginning with the electronic healthcare record uh, system. And this is really uh, born out of the health disparities of COVID. Um, we want to redress the challenges of health inequalities, support those researchers um, who, who are working with healthcare records to connect social determinants of health, imaging data, other data, uh, look at uh, biases and algorithms and data, data paucity, uh, as well as develop predictive models. And finally, to catalyze um, a more inclusive uh, data set in AI and ML applications. You may have also heard of our Bridged AI program this slide is a slight, slightly old. I'm not entirely sure if we've awarded these centers or not, but we are uh, funding um, a number of centers to create those flagship data sets, the standards and tools and ethical rubric, rubrics that are uh, data science driven, as well as a one coordinating center to look across all of our data centers. And finally, last but not least, we want to build a diverse data science workforce um, here's how you can help us. Send us your awesome students. Every year we host a number of undergrads who come to NIH uh, either in person or virtually. They work on some really cool programs. Um, a lot of work on na natural language processing, uh, binning and looking at grants, classifying grants, building dashboards um, for our granting systems, identifying health disparities um, in our research, uh, helping us get uh, that basically get our funding announcements out quicker. <laughs> um, lots of really good work. So send us your undergrads or your grads. If, you're in, if your uh, students are interested in a 10 week program to work in the intramural research program on artificial intelligence or data science, they do come um, uh, at a master's level for uh, 10 weeks. And finally, if you yourself are interested 
in spending a sabbatical at NIH, um, we have some really hard problems. These are some of the hardest problems that we're working on. These are data scholars from industry, from academia, from nonprofits profits and other agencies. They work to catalyze neuroscience research. They're supporting knowledge extraction in cancer. They're looking to adopt machine learning um, in medical imaging. Actually, that's working with um, the Midrix uh, Center. One of the really cool projects is harnessing data science for Africa, um, expanding theories of brain circuits. Um, and finally, our, our interoperability program that I presented earlier was um, led in part by a data scholar. And with that, um, every month we host a data sharing and data reuse seminar. We just had ours today at noon. So the next one will be on November 19th at noon. And so just sort of, um, if you're interested, I hope that you'll watch the webpage and, and join us. It takes a village to do all this work. I did not do this by myself or even within our office. There's more than 200 individuals working across NIH, working with my office um, and we, appreciate each and every one of their contributions and they're just um, listed here um, as some of the team leads. And I am more than happy to take questions I, I, and stay for as long as you like. Thank you so much. I hope that um, this whirlwind tour of data science and findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable areas has been of interest to you. It certainly is of interest to me. Thank you, Susan, for a brilliant talk. A lot of interesting areas and it's just amazing the amount of things NIH and your office is doing to address some of the issues of our day in data and computing and software. So with that, uh, let's all give uh, Susan a virtual round of applause. Uh, it, it's a little better in person, but uh, thank you very much. And uh, let's open it up for questions. Susan has agreed to stay on for a little bit for to answer Absolutely. questions. So please raise your hands and I'll call on you. 